You're tuning in to the Bueno Power Hour podcast. Okay. okay. Well, since we're here now, let's just talk it out and learn from one another. We can chalk it out. Find our path on these roads, side walking now. Cause nothing's set in stone but that guitar while he's rocking out. So plug in and tune up and tune in. And if you made it this far, then guess what? You win. So settle in and connect. Let go and gather all this love and respect. They know that this could be your favorite time in the day, though, to feel that power. It's bueno. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Bueno Power Hour podcast. I am your host, Arthur Bueno, and I got a very, 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 very special guest with me today, uh, Courtney Coles. Uh, if you don't know her, um, you know, Google her up. She's a pretty, <laughs> she's a pretty well-known photographer, and I've seen her grown, you know, from, you know, the Tumblr days. Uh, as to where I had found her. Um, I think my discovery with Courtney Coles did start with Tumblr. And uh, I think it was a photo film uh, page in Tumblr that uh, reblogged you. I think it was a it was a self-portrait that you did. And I'm like, huh, this looks really good. And I noticed the camera, like, right off the bat, like, okay, you know, she's, she's using the real shit. You know, she's using the Mayas. <laughs> And so I was kind of like, you know what, I'm going to follow her. And it kind of, you know, took me to sort of a journey as to how she was growing as an artist. Um, she was actually one of the reasons why I am now friends with uh, Nika Aquino, who I love dearly. She's uh, a person who's actually supported me as well in, in you know, all my you know, ideas and photographs, and we did a split zine together and such. Um, if I remember correctly, you're currently living in uh, Southern California, around the LA area, correct, Courtney? Yes, I am in LA. Awesome. Okay. And so to kind of just wrap it up here uh, for the intro, I did get a chance to see her work and meet her in, in real, uh, for real at a To The Front DIY show in Brooklyn, New York. And I was able to do a small little interview on my now defunct, uh, you know, the Bueno Power, you know, vlog. And it was really nice to meet, you know, Courtney and kind of just see where she was coming from with photographs and such. And just to kind of see the sort of the beginnings of To The Front, in which now we are here conducting this interview. Courtney Coles! Oh my Yay. god, dude! <laughs> hi, hi, hi. Oh my god, Brooklyn. That was so many lifetimes ago. Uh, <laughs> I miss it. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you do. And, you know, this whole kind of 2020 has been a straight up wash. I know that. A lot of our folks are, you know, definitely for the artists have been struggling quite a bit, but have been prevailing in the amount of community support that's been kind of going on. Um, and, you know, I have been doing a lot of research uh, prior to this interview, seeing like, you know, what you have, you know, kind of talked about. I think you've already talked about your beginnings as a photographer uh, quite a bit and sort of. Uh, those kinds of things that, you know, I, I feel people keep repeating. So this interview, I want to do something a little bit different. We're going to be a little bit more kind of artistically nerdy here. Yay! And <laughs> 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 okay, we're going to be a little bit more artistic, artistically nerdy. Uh, just for the simple fact is that, you know, yes, you are definitely known um, in this universe that we call, you know, photography, call art. And I think it'd be kind of fun to sort of, you know, kind of shake things up a little bit. But there's actually one question that's been sort of in my mind quite a bit uh, amongst my friends and such. Uh, one of them is, is um, how's this year's photography treated you? Um, how has it been since the start of pandemic? And like, what have you been doing to sort of like survive as an artist? Like, how has the photography industry or just, like, photography my relationship with, like, the medium? 
or both. That that we're we're going personal. We 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 not we not about the industry. We're about Courtney Coles and her artistic <laughs> like you know you know kind of like you know ordeal here. So yeah, like kind of what what your relationship was or has been with it uh, this year. Um, I think at the beginning of the year, I not talk about the industry, but you know, at the beginning of the year, I was having a lot of just like back and forth with myself of mm -hmm. just really being honest with what I want to do professionally and also like as a person, like an artist, like a human. And I think it was, I don't know, February, March, like definitely a few weeks before lockdown happened, I settled on, oh shit, I go to all these queer parties. Why not just be a fucking party photographer? Like I, <laughs> I'm always at these events and like no one's saying that has to be my like end all be all but like it'll be a nice uh it'll be a nice way to give back to my community mm -hmm. and the other people within the community and then also just pretty much you know have something in my pocket in my account just to keep me afloat mm -hmm. and then um shutdown happened and then everything closed and i was like whoa i don't know what to do with myself <laughs> right because uh i was working in music and working at events for cal arts as a freelancer so most of my income came from that. And so when events and music closed, because we were the first industry to close, when that closed, right. I was like, well, maybe I can possibly, I don't know, do freelancing with CalArts. And then they closed. And I was like, okay, I don't know anything. And then the entire, <laughs> world, the entire world closed down. And um, it was just dark. Like, it, like, I don't know how dark it was, like, you know, blacked out most of the year right <laughs> but right it was such a weird uh weird place to be in to not have like a backup 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 plan because my backup plan has always been going back to coffee being barista and um that just didn't that yeah no <laughs> and so <laughs> that was such a weird space to like actually be in to finally come to terms with like okay you're good at this thing you love being at this you know at these parties in these places with these people why not give back to the community doing this and to go from having it all figured out to having literally nothing was so strange and right. it's still strange. Like it's been nine months and it's still so strange to go, wow, I was finally getting out there and now I'm back in a, in a hole, like right, in a cave right. to like go back and stuff. But with photo, like photography itself, it, it brought me back to the beginning of why I do what I do, like as a like forget artist, just as a person. Like I, I love myself. That sounds so vain, but like I love, <laughs> I love myself, and like I love being alone, and I love, I love reading, I love music, I love just being like, just being alone, you know, and documenting that, and like looking at smaller things and right. trying to make sure you know everything is accounted for, and so this whole quarantine pandemic whatever you want to call it this whole thing has really just brought me back home in a way that i'm like seeing the rest of like the world go oh no self-portraits we all have to be at home now and it's like well welcome to my life it's so beautiful here it's, <laughs> it's, it's great i love it because it's like it's like it's i love i love people finally you know having that opportunity to really kind of turn the cameras on themselves because that's all they have is you know right. them or their, or their kids or their partners or whatever but it's just it's nice to have the world catch up to you, if that makes sense. Like, this, despite being boring and not boring, being depressing, it's nice to have the world catch up to me and go, oh, we're looking at our living spaces now. And it's right. like, yes, we are. <laughs> I right, love it here. Right, right. I, man, you know, and it's so weird how, you know, a lot of that um, kind of thing in photography where people have no choice but to, you know, sort of, use what they have around them as i guess uh, uh that's their limitation of to trying to capture something that may be meaningful or whatever um uh. yeah it is it is a little tough you know what i mean and it, it's kind of one of those things that i really appreciate about you corny about your vulnerability as a photographer and um you know, doing your best to sort of like, you know, giving back the community and such. I, I definitely love, that's definitely punk rock, you know, to me. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? Um, and it's so funny how like this sort of kind of transitions to the next question that I had. You know, we talking about, because we're talking about this personal Courtney Coles, you know, uh, types of things. You know what I'm saying? We're talking about her projects sort of 
that sort of like world in in this conversation. I wanted to ask you, um, what was your very first personal project that you were very proud of? Ooh, um, that's a very good question. Mm-hmm. Mainly because I don't, I still don't look at what I do as work and as projects because mm-hmm. everything in my mind, everything is so connected and it's all the same thing. And uh, I think it's probably been my self portraits and yes. yeah, it's probably my self portraits. And that's, that was a thing that I didn't really bring into the classroom or critiques or space, like, you know, just um, theory spaces because I didn't see myself Courtney Coles as like worthy of talking about this person slash the way these photos were made because it just felt like my diary. Right. <laughs> it felt like I was like reading my diary and it's like, you're paying all this money to be in art school to talk about pictures of yourself. And then it became this whole thing where I, like I was at, at PNCA. It was probably like our first semester of our thesis. Mm-hmm. So the p- proposal year or proposal semester and a friend of mine, he had seen, or he had like over my shoulder and like saw photos of me and my family and was like just blown away by all of it. And he asked, you know, why I wasn't bringing that into the classroom? And I was just like so thrown off. It's like, why would I talk about myself? Like that makes no sense <laughs> whatsoever. Like, ah, uh, no, my family art, what? And so it took a lot of like soul searching because he said, you know, if you keep bringing in photos that, you know, you don't care about, you're going to become very good at making photos you don't care about. Right. And it's like, okay, th- yeah, thanks for thanks for that. And so, um, yeah, I ended up bringing in photos of myself into the crit spaces. And it became this whole thing of me understanding what my um, place was within this very white school in this very white city mm-hmm. in this predominantly white you know, medium like photography is historically just the whitest thing ever. Absolutely. And so it's like, how do I, how do I add to the conversation? And so it's been a journey of that. And then self portraits versus selfies and just like the whole thing, because there is a difference. There's a massive difference between the two. And it's funny because my thesis year was the year that Sophie became like the word of the year. Mm-hmm. And so it was this whole thing of like me trying to defend the art of the self portrait in this age of selfie culture or whatever. And um, just so everyone knows, like, you know, in my, in my opinion, like a selfie is a portrait of yourself made with the intent of putting on the internet and a self portrait is it can be made with the, you know, iPhone or Android or whatever camera phone you have. But a self portrait is made with the intent of just understanding the, you know, the self and then it can be on the internet, but that's not the intent of it existing. Like it's not right. made with the intent of like, we're going on Twitter or going on tw- Tumblr or Instagram or Facebook. It's just, you can live there, but that's not what it is. Right. And so, um, yeah, it became this whole thing of like, you know, me learning about me and um, implementing other um, other cameras, like using either a cell phone or disposable camera or like Mamiya's or a Canon or the photo booth, just any kind of thing to kind of like document the self and having that be an archive. And mm. so that's been my favorite project thus far because it's just, it's, I feel like artists are so afraid of like looking at the why they do the things they do and they forget that they are the constant right. <laughs> thing. And so why not ask, why am I the way I am? Cause it opens the door to other, you know, other things. And right. that's where I'm at. The vulnerability of, of those self portraits uh, are pretty damn captivating. And I think that a lot of people don't really, I don't know. It, it's almost as if that they're afraid to kind of see you know, themselves in front of a camera because, you know, lots of times people, let's just be real, most of the time photographers are photographers because they know, they know for most, most of the time they don't like pictures of themselves. They like Uh pictures of, of other people. And I think, uh, you know, psychologically, I think they try to sort of create sort of put themselves into other people and scenes like, you know, I kind of wish I was, you know, 
that good looking or that type of person. I, I sort of mm-hmm. like, you know what I mean? Kind of, they, they have their own portrait with other, you know, other people. I guess that's yeah. sort of a weird thing. Um, I, I especially like the photo booth uh, series that you did and uh, you blew up those pictures. You blew up those pictures for an exhibit. Is that, is that one of them standing? Yes. I, they originally were just going to be left alone as like little photo strips. And it was after my, um, my mid residency at CalArts, my front for grad school, where I was just super duper, like so burnt out from my family work. I was tired of talking about my parents, tired of talking about like my upbringing, just so tired of like all of it. I, and I think it was more of a, I needed a break. Right. And so I was looking at my entire stack of photo strips from over the years and I thought to myself, well, I should probably scan these anyway. Like, why not just get that as a head start? And I started scanning them and I realized, oh, wait, I can actually make this into what I want to talk about within my work because I kept going or I kept thinking to myself, everyone keeps missing the actual point. It's me. Let's talk about me. <laughs> and I, I thought, this, you know, the best way to do that would be to bring in the photo strips with some text and, you know, have it literally say what I want to say and have that guide the discussion. And it grew from the text to just existing as the photo strip blown up. And through all of that scanning, I came to realize that there was another layer of what the photo strips were doing. Mm -hmm. And it became this whole beautiful thing of, me coming out to myself, but also coming out to the photo booth. And it, since that coming out, really owning up, you know, just all the different layers of myself and mm. the booth itself and like how the booth exists within the culture and like within the world and just so many other things. And so the booth has been so fun and so lovely and miss it dearly, but I have <laughs> my own. So it's, everything's okay. <laughs> Yeah, I I definitely love how you sort of um, brought that, you know, photo booth aesthetic uh, home and uh, started, you know, doing Polaroid work, which was that a conscious decision of just because, you know, I guess on a photo booth, you know, we don't really know exactly how the images are going to turn out from the print. Is that kind Mm -hmm. of how you sort of thought about, you know, uh, bringing that photo booth aesthetic home? Kind of. It it definitely started out of panic because I mm. took my last strip because I take at least one strip a month um, prior to lockdown to mm-hmm. quarantine, and I took my last strip maybe a couple of weeks before um, we are all told to stay home, and so I thought to myself, okay, we'll be out by late April. You know, if we do this right, we're good, and it became this whole thing where we're probably two or three weeks into the quarantine and I, I just had a feeling we would be in lockdown for at least another year and a half. Wow. And so I had like a panic attack. I was like, Oh my gosh, I, I am not ready for this body of work to end because it still feels like there's more to it than just, you know, going to a bar and sitting down and do my thing. And it became this thing where I was having back and forth with myself because it was always in my notes where I was like making notes of how can I push what I'm doing with the photo like what else can I ask this right and it became this thing where I reached a decision to bring it home but I just didn't know how to kind of properly do it because I know I wanted to use film but I also didn't want to I didn't want to quote unquote waste film I don't think you're wasting film, but in my Virgo brain, it's like, I don't want to waste this. I want to do it right and get it right the first time. <laughs> no experimenting. We're doing this thing. We're a master of our craft. And it, it took have my friend Carly say to me or text me, I know it's not the same thing, but like, have you considered using a 35 millimeter as, you know, your camera of choice? And then from there, having that, you know, existing as your photo booth, like it's not the same thing, but it's like, you know, in the same vein. And I was like, yes, oh my goodness, yes, yes, yes. And mm-hmm. I just needed someone else to say it because I was thinking about that, but I was trying, I was like doubting my own, my own skills as a photographer <laughs> to do that. And so I think the first couple of months I used um, my 35, my very first camera, 35 millimeter. It's a Canon Rebel K2. The K2, yeah. I, yes. I had that camera years ago and uh, 
I fucking dropped it and it just fell into no. pieces. Yes. Ah. <laughs> well, mine, mine is definitely held together by a uh, duct tape because a year after I got it, my sister had kicked it. <laughs> it was like underneath my um because i kept my camera in my car and so she like kicked my camera and didn't know she did that and it just broke the door so i've yet to get it fixed um 11 years later it's still <laughs> <taped up. laughs> but it's fine she still works but yes i used the um i would test with my mark ii and then just get the settings right and then mm. i would switch over to the k2 and i would take four photos you know back to back to back to back and then let it live and then regroup myself and take four photos again back to back to back to right. simulate the photo booth. Right. And there was, there was no me going to check myself. There was no mirror in my studio. It was just me and the camera and the flash. Right. And I think, because I wasn't satisfied because it felt like there should be more because the photos felt too perfect. Right. <laughs> like they, felt, they, felt too, they felt too polished. And I personally don't like that within my work. I don't like the... I don't like the pretty. I don't like the polish. I like the slight motion blur. I like the imperfections because you can right. feel the emotion more than just it being a well lit studio photo. And I think I landed on Polaroid because I had always wanted a self portrait making thing with Polaroid, but I somehow never could afford it. But with the help of the government and our stimulus check, I was able to spend the money <laughs> and not feel guilty about doing it because I had been I've been holding on to every penny I got since you know everything happened. Sure. But this felt like very important and very much necessary to move my work forward. And the first, I think the first Polaroid I took, I felt it. I was like, "This is it. I did it. I took a photo. Sent it to my friend Steph." And also Carly. And I was like, I think I did. I think I found the camera. And their book was like, yes, this is it. <laughs> I'm so excited to see where you go with this. And um, from there, it grew you know, to having my red backdrop, which mimics the red backdrop of the booth at Cha Cha, which is my favorite. Right. And also the only color photo booth in LA. And um, co color photo, oh my gosh, color film photo booth in LA. And so having all those layers and adding my own spin to it being the self-portrait aspect of the Polaroid made it just, it, it felt right. Mm -hmm. And so um, it feels, like it feels modern. I hate that word. I hate it so much, but <laughs> it, it, feel, it feels contemporary and modern uh, with that nod to the history of the photo booth. And since I don't see us opening up to public spaces again and i don't see myself feeling safe in a booth again anytime soon right it's nice to have my own at home right right so in in kind of in that uh, aspect because we're gonna get kind of like tech nerdy here um are you do you have like a <laughs> tripod for the polaroid camera and are you using natural light or are you using um like the on-camera flash, or do you have like a floodlight sort of, you know, uh, angled on you when you're taking these portraits? So the ones at home, like before I moved out, I was using, I mean, I am using a tripod from there. What kind of tripod? I'm not quite sure. It was like, <laughs> it was like thrown out from a friend just getting rid of gear and it's broken. So I just used it right. without a head. And um, a friend of mine, another friend of mine, she had moved towards, you know, the middle of the pandemic. She was like, I can't afford to live in LA anymore. I'm getting rid of all my stuff, going to the woods. And so I inherited the tripod from her. And so that's what I'm currently using. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to flash or lighting, uh, definitely depends. I use natural light for most, but mm -hmm. then also on camera flash if I need that extra little bump <laughs> right, little, right little thing but so far it's been like my apartment has the most beautiful natural light and it's like beautiful i in love with it it's so great <laughs> so i use just, yeah i use natural light with the tripod and it's within arm's reach for me okay so i'm not sure how much how long my distance is because i have short arms but it's within arm's reach of me or arm's length of me and uh i use the portrait setting on my um iphones to trigger the at the shutter and what really oh my gosh yeah so polaroid the one step plus i'm assuming it's just with that camera plus you know the newer cameras you're able to um set up bluetooth and release the shutter from your phone what really yeah 
with yeah with the app i <laughs> it's i did not the, know that it's the most beautiful thing and it's like digital is just it's technology is wild i, I know am, it makes me think back to all the times when i wish i had known that because something in me just was too stubborn to ever look up any of this but it's been around for a hot second and it yeah it's so great so you can set up your camera do your own thing and release the shutter from your phone from like a little bluetooth <laughs> wow okay so that that changes everything for me because uh so because you're using um i forgot what film uh type you're using but i i have you know a polaroid sx70 um, mm -hmm. and i bought that from some fucking gift shop or like thrift store like years ago for like thirty dollars and it was surprised oh my god and it works and it works Ugh. yeah it works Gosh. so you know you know damn well that you know with certain cameras you know back in the day when they're in like sort of uh, thrift stores like that you know uh the ceiling is starting to you know uh break off uh mm -hmm. you know some of the some of the um the we uh, not wheels i don't know what what i'm saying here but you know some of some of the things inside the camera is like dried out like all the oil yeah, the lubrication you, have all yeah. you have to clean it out so we you know for people that don't you know pay attention to a lot of this stuff as photographers especially in film you know we call it cla which is you know clean lubricate uh, lubricate and adjust you know cameras and um <coughs> this is essentially what you have to do um you know, a, a good amount of years when you're like shooting like me and Courtney quite a bit with, you know, film cameras, you have to make sure that your stuff is CLA'd. Otherwise, you know, you'll you'll get some, you know, weird kind of like uh, focusing uh, issues and such. And uh -huh. you know, some of the some of the cranks, that's what it is. Some of the cranks will, you know, work properly and it will actually snap. So, yeah, it, what was weird is that it actually it actually worked well. And, I you know, I had to like, you know spend twenty dollars to sort of test you know the camera and it, thank god it actually like came out but you know it, i think it might be dying just because it's uh. yeah yeah so it's, it's it's unfortunate man but i'll i'll i i may courtney i may just go get that one step I, dude I, yes I, the I, one I'm step like, plus i think they have like a sx70 as well but i'm not sure if it's like self-portrait it probably is but yeah it's i love it so much and it's inexpensive i mean that's that's a reach it's expensive right but in a grand scheme of cameras like itself it's inexpensive and it i use 600 and also i type film because it lets you use both old school and the new uh, film so it's okay. it's great because you, you also get the film at like target or yeah target so it's like if you don't want to order online you get film right now go to target and they'll have some there Damn. So there, there's a lot of yeah. It, it there's chances of actually getting this film, and that's so funny. Like we, we talk about these kinds of things. That's you know the little additions for like you know old technology that we need that we needed at the time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I really do dig. Um, you actually mentioned something because uh, you know, now I'm kind of like going off script here because I had like a <laughs> bunch of questions here, and this is good because this is you know we're doing it live. You know what I mean? Um, so. I know that you scan. Do you scan your own film? Uh, film, film, no. Okay. I have a lab here in LA that I've been going to since 2008 who handles all my film for me. And uh, it's, oh, I love them so much. They, <laughs> they have seen me through like my early work where I was figuring everything out. Cause I, again, I'm self taught, but I also have two degrees. So it's that nice right. little thing. It's a nice thing of I, um, went to school originally for journalism, so I was taking photo classes, but I everything I, I know, like the basic whatevers, I learned via Flickr. Yeah, <laughs> and so yeah, yeah, I would yeah. read a bunch of the concert uh, photo threads, take it to heart, and then go to shows and like get developed and then, you know, come back and back and forth. And so it's this whole thing. Uh, it was this whole thing of me trusting this lab and then going, wow, it's been like a thousand years and you've seen me bring in probably some of the most horrendous photos. <laughs> <laughs> Cause they're also like, they're near CSUN. So they got to see a bunch of photo students bringing their work in, but it's yeah. So long story. Yes. I, or I take my film in to get developed um and scanned by this lab but for my thesis i did scan in my own 
like I got everything developed at the dark room, but then I also right. went back in to rescan what I wanted to blow up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That, that makes sense because, um, so for me, I have like five to six like years worth of images that I, half of it is developed and half of it is still undeveloped and none of it has been scanned. Uh. Yeah. So, um, and then it's good that you're you're very very adamant. I love that about you. You're very very adamant about making sure that you get your film developed and scanned, and you got those images because I'm gonna tell you something, Courtney. I spent about maybe six to seven hundred dollars, like just recently, like trying to get this shit developed. And I, <laughs> yeah, it's just been it's been crazy. It's, it's so like I love film so much, but I also have like a bunch of roles from many years ago that have not been developed and I think I feel like I know when they were made but it's like do I really want to see these memories again the answer is probably no no right right. (laughs) they're gonna sit like in my fridge just like here you go live in an amenity I don't need you right it's I need I mean I'm bad at archiving my my negatives like these still are in the boxes from the lab which is probably my only like reckless thing I do is just the fact that I am so bad at like properly putting them in binders and mm. one day I'll like, have the income to hire someone to just do it for me because <laughs> I it's therapeutic when you're when you get in the grip of it like in the, in the the way of doing it but I just somehow my brain's like we don't want to do this and I go yeah you're, you're right we're not gonna do this today that, <laughs> so that's we don't. that's <laughs> man you're talking you're talking my language man I swear to god because that's exactly how I feel about um kind of in 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 photography today you know we have all these images that whether if it's digital or film that was taken and you know for some reason in the back of our head we're like you know what not right now i'm just gonna yeah, put no. that right there and um I'll, I'll get back to it soon and we never we never fucking do it you know what i mean and it's just it's frustrating i mean it's frustrating to kind of like and it's also a validating to the fact that you also have, you know, kind of that sort of situation as well. Because, man, I thought I was the only one dealing with that. Oh, no, shit, I am probably – it's so – it's – I feel like I'm the only person I know who has that mentality of like, oh, God, I don't want to. Right. Because a lot of my a lot of my friends who use film, they are so on it. Like from top to bottom, they're just very – much to get their stuff archived immediately they have their workflow it's just, you know a great way but for me it's i am so not even like the nerdiest techiest person you'll ever meet like it may <laughs> seem like it but i know literally enough to get me by and if it's a camera i love i'm gonna like make sure i don't break it right but when it comes to specs and iso and whatever i don't i go to my friend Raphael and, he, and i ask him okay Here's what I do. <laughs> what camera can help me do that thing? <laughs> right, right. And he's like that. He's the person for it because I, I'm so much about the feeling of a thing. Like I will take all my photos on my phone if I have to. Like I don't, I don't really need the film. Mm. But it's the whole thing of I wish I were as nerdy as most people. But for me, that's just it takes away from me if I know too much about how this is gonna come out. If it makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think what you're, <laughs> I, if I, if I understand correctly, I think that you work well with limitations. Is that what I'm understanding? A little bit. Cause okay. I, if I have too much, if no one gives me anything to do, I short circuit. Cause I don't know what to do. <laughs> I need to know something like what, what can I, can I not do before I go out and just do whatever, because I want to have an idea of what, you may be expecting from me. Right. Um, even with my personal work, I have an idea of you know what the final image will look like because I've studied the light enough to know in my brain how it will come out, which is a thing that I, it took years to get here. But I remember my very first photo class, my teacher telling us that one day you'll get to a place where you can like look at the light and envision this. Until then, do this. And I was just so envious of the whole, oh man, he, he knows how to look at the corner and go like, yes, ISO 400, whatever, here we go. And yep. I was just so jealous of that. But now I'm at that point of like, oh man, I don't have my light meter, but I feel like it'll be this and it'll end up being that and it'll be exactly the way I imagined it. 
And so it's like a pride of like, yes, I did it. <laughs> it took me a thousand years, but I finally did it. I know what Sean was talking about. Like, oh my gosh, I can teach now. <laughs> so it's that whole thing of if I have a rough idea of what is expected, I can do it. But if I know too much about something, I my brain just like looks for every little tiny thing. So like, well, what if I just do this instead? I, right. No. <laughs> right, 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 right. You do, I mean, it's kind of like... I guess it's that rebellious sort of thinking as an artist where it's like, okay, well, we have these tools, but what's a, a way to kind of like, I don't know, experiment with that idea, you know, with, yeah. with the tools that you have. And I, I get Experiment that. and also simplify it because right, I, right. at least that's how I see how I work. Like it's the most simple of ways you can do with the equipment that I have. Right. Um, not like I don't know how to use other things. It's just, for me, it's like, why would I bring an entire setup where I could just use myself and the sun? I kind of think. I I have to, man, I have to give you, I have to cl applaud you on that. <laughs> because, because I, look, look, and there, this is the reason why I say this, because, I mean, man, okay, so back in the day, you know, we, we were taught, yeah, man, you got to get Nikon or Canon, like DSLRs. You know, your shit's going to be 100 pounds on your shoulder. Yeah. And we're going to, you're going to, you're going to have to take these photographs that you just, you don't care about. And I used to shoot shows myself when I was, uh, when I was living in San Francisco, because you and I are art school graduates. So I, art school. Yeah. I, man, my arts, I loved it. I, there, that's a question I'm going to ask you in a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> I used to, uh, I actually graduated from the Academy of Art University over in uh, San Francisco years uh -huh. ago. And at the time, you know, they said, you know, DSLRs, you need to get this camera, blah, 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 blah. And, um, it wasn't until I think when I started using film and I met people who were like photographing in the street and were actually, you know, photographing themselves and their friends and their family is where it's like, okay, one camera, one lens, whatever I see in front of me, I'm going to try to calculate the light. Do you use the sunny 16 rule when you're calculating light? Uh, yes. Well, I have okay. a light meter in my, on my iPhone because my Numa meter, like the one I'm currently using, mm -hmm. it has a built-in meter, but something is wonky with it. So I figured just use, I was download an app for it. Right. But when it comes to, um, most things, I'll like do the whole sign 16. Yes. 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 And go from there. Yeah. And that, that's what your, that's kind of your main camera right now is the, the Mamiya, right? Yeah. This okay. is M645. Shit, dude. And I also, before that one, I have the 645E. Mm. And the funniest, like, the beautiful story of, like, why Mamiya over anything else, it's <laughs> because of Lauren Dukoff, who is a photographer. I, I love Lauren's work. Mm. And I came to know her work. It must have been my space, but also must have been someone speaking about her or just seeing her photos on the internet, something that brought me to her. Right. And I want it so because i know for a fact that it's not the camera that makes the image it's the photographer right but in my mind it was okay i know that but i also want what she has sure, and so sure, sure. i um have always won you know mamiya because she's a mamiya and in college at pnca i one of my like my, my first friend i made his name is ryan and we're still friends to say he i told him that story because we had um, similar music taste and just right. like mutual friends and it's just like a small world all that and so I told him the story about like how I love Lauren Dukoff and how she's a, a Mamiya and on the wild and how she has a contact so just all these things and so when he left Portland for a little bit he came back and told me he had a gift for me and I had no idea what it was and then he brought out uh Take a Back Sunday vinyl along with his Mamiya that he had. He's like, I don't use this. What? You should, you should have this. And I was like, I'm not going to take your Mamiya. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, name your price. I think he like named like 250 or whatever it was. And so I, I gave him, you know, I gave him 250 for it. And I used the 645E as my main camera for a number of years. And wow. then 
it broke and then it got fixed and then it broke again. And so I was like, I can't keep doing this, can't afford it. So I'm just going to buy another Mamiya. <laughs> <laughs> Which I did, it was like $300. But okay. it's this whole thing of like my second, I mean, my first camera, I guess Ryan only used it like a handful of times. And then the owner before that used it a handful of times. So this camera was brand new. Like it was just wow, okay. brand new Mamiya. And I, it was my everything for like five or so years. And then this one wow well that's that's great have you thought about using any rangefinder can uh cameras because i i know that uh <laughs> one of your friends daniel parsons who i follow on instagram uh she actually uses a canon ql 17 it's like i guess uh-huh. a, ra- a, a rangefinder camera have you ever thought about using those types of cameras by any chance yes and no um mm. i love the idea of, of it but for me it's like adding another thing to my arsenal and it just doesn't feel like I need to have one just to have one if it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Like I want one. I would love to use a rangefinder, but I already have my point and shoot for my friend Tessie. Like I have uh, it like this. Okay. I don't need another one. Right. Um, I don't need another Mamiya. Like I don't right. need another, another digital camera. It's like, I'm so simple with the gear I have because to me, it's like, if I add too many bells and whistles to my bag, I'm going to have a panic attack figuring out which one do I want to bring out for, <laughs> right. for which thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You have, you have that anxiety too, because I, I, um, I used to pack, I, I pack a Leica and I Ugh. trust me, court. If, if you ever, if you ever, ever get a chance and you have the means for it, I think, I think a Leica M4 will work for you. If Leica wants to give me a camera <laughs> to be an ambassador, I will gladly add a Leica to my bag. <laughs> Only because, like, why not shake up the boys club? Like, I would, in a heartbeat, yes. if they were to, like, slide in my email and ask me, we love your work, or we tell me, you know, we love your work. How would you feel about being an ambassador? Here's a camera. You make a body <laughs> work. I would. I honestly would. <laughs> and and that's that's you know being a I I used to be a gearhead so I used to have like cameras after cameras like years ago but I I definitely simplified my stuff. Uh thankfully um I still shoot a, with a couple of point and shoot cameras. Uh I do have a medium format camera. Uh it's a little little big for me man but um yeah, mainly the camera that I use is my Leica M4, and that's probably mm-hmm. the, you know that's kind of the camera that I use on the daily. I bring around, and for digital, I have a, a Fuji X100T. So that oh, camera, that's beautiful. It's it is a good camera. Are you are you using a Canon DSLR right now, right? Yes, I'm using a Mark. Oh my gosh, a Mark IV. Yes, okay. Mark IV. Okay. Okay. And yeah, yeah that's a it's a baby. That's a beast, man. That's some. Um, you get good coverage with that fucking camera, dude. I swear to God. Yes, I and I also use it in the most simplest of ways you can use the camera. I use it for clients who need their photos ASAP. Yeah. Uh, my light, my no, my lab is very quick, but I'm not gonna be that person to make them work extra hard to, to right. develop my film right now because I just love the relationship that we have. Right. Um, so yeah, for clients who need images immediately, I use the Mark IV. And it's great. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of like sort of drift out to kind of a a little bit more of an artistic kind of like uh, question that I had. Um, And I've been thinking about this because I've been thinking about school. We've been kind of sort of talking about school a little bit. And I got to tell you, I do miss my school uh, and I do miss my professors. Um, And this question sort of like had me in my head for a while. Um, what were some of the assignments you had in art school that were very unique that you still hold today? Ooh. Right? I'm tra- yeah, because it's been a thousand years. <laughs> and it's also funny because I was just digging through my old hard drives because I gave a uh, an, like lecture talk to a photo class at uh, UC Santa Barbara. So it made me kind of go deep into my archive to find these self-portraits I want to talk about. 
And I came back to my thesis year, and now it's just looking at baby Courtney doing her thing. And right. these images I hadn't thought about in forever. And then I went back last week to look at more photographs. And it's such a wild space to see what I was trying to do and like not having language for it just yet, but knowing exactly what, oh, yes, I know what you're doing. What you're right. doing. Right. Um, I can't remember, for the life of me, I can't remember any of my assignments, but I do remember being just I don't know I was like I wouldn't even say depressed because like it was another another feeling but just feeling so alone and so mm. far from all my friends like I had friends in Portland mm-hmm. and I still have you know we're all still friends today or most of us right. still friends today but I I remember just being so far from my support system and not knowing how to vocalize that outside of making you know the <clears throat> we sell portraits mm-hmm. and just making photographs of my home and of my space. And I think in my four by five class, cause we had to use all black and white and I did not like that. I was just so against <laughs> being forced to only use black and white because yeah. I didn't see the world in black and white. Like the right. only world I saw in black and white were concerts. And so it was so strange to like, how can I make my everyday life black and, <laughs> right. black and white? Right. And so I remember taking or making a lot of photographs around my apartment, around my home. So I was home a lot. I was by myself. And I think to this day, I'm still making the exact same photographs. And it's, <laughs> it's this thing of trying to, it's just literally, it's documenting your every day. It's a diary. So it's, yeah. you write about the same thing. You're like, today I did X, Y, Z. Well, today I photographed my kitchen or today right. I photographed my bathroom. Yeah. Uh, today I photographed my bed. It's this whole thing of like the passing of time. And so, yeah, eight, nine, 10 years later, I'm still making the same photographs. And I think it's from that limitation of, Four by five, black and white, make an image. And it's like, oh, mm, no, but okay, I guess. Right, I guess. okay, <laughs> okay. Well, that, well, I, because I had assignments that I, I think about, um, you know, here and there. And there was actually a professor um, in Academy of Art University a while back. His name was David Wasserman. And he he did this thing where he kind of made he made us kind of think about the image and how to mm-hmm. how to approach it. Uh, in which this is kind of in, in a question I I'll, I'll be asking as well, like another question in regards to this. So he asked me he asked our class. He goes, "All right, I want you guys to make a portrait without making a portrait." And I go, mm. I go, what the fuck does that mean? And then <laughs> you know what I mean. And then like, um. And, and I, I thought about it and I was looking and this is one of those things where back to what we were talking about early in conversation where we kind of sometimes we need sort of a guide to sort of get get us into certain directions. Right. Mm-hmm. And and it, it was so weird how people got it. I'm like, am I dumb or is it just <laughs> I'm not like thinking about the image? And what it meant was, is that sometimes you could take a portrait of something that that is of you but it's not really you like yep. a, you know what i mean like a cup of coffee or like a fucking room or a car and mm-hmm. whatnot and so this sort of um uh, this sort of question um and why i brought it up is sort of made me kind of think about work and how i approach things uh now these days so since from from the time you started photography till now um what is your old approaches and what are your new approaches in photography today i think my approach hasn't changed oh okay and they're like 16 20 whatever years i've been <laughs> yes. making, making photos right it's i think if anything i oh my gosh I th- yeah i think if anything i'm more vocal about what I'm mm. making a photograph of, like okay. if I'm making a photograph of someone, it's less of, I'm just taking a photo of the moment. It's, and it's more of, I would like to remember this. Um, I'm very overwhelmed right now and I'm going to probably forget this moment happened. Right. So I am doing this quite possibly just to preserve it. Mm-hmm. Um, or I'm so overwhelmed. I can't do anything but make a picture kind of thing. Okay. Whereas I'm sure years ago I was just snapping away. Just like, push, push, push. Here we go. Right. Right. Um, but I think now I, 
even with yeah, with well, I don't see him with my partner and my family, but like right. I, I definitely do feel like pre all this, I try my best to like live in the moment and not compulsively make images to like preserve it. Mm. And that has helped a lot. Um with just like my brain. <laughs> right. Um and so portrait wise, I I have I definitely do have, like, I want to tack on to, you know, what your professor said about making portraits without making a portrait. Right. My uh, teacher, his name is Victor Maldonado, when I was at CalArts, or not CalArts, at the NCA, he, uh, <clears throat> his assignment he gave me was to um, photograph something that terrifies you. And I was just like, what? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was this whole thing that I knew exactly what he was, you know, leaning at because... Right. He knew, I feel like he must have known that you're photographing all your friends because you're trying to find yourself in your friends. Why don't you just photograph yourself? You know, so I, mm-hmm. I knew what he was doing. And I also knew that uh, he wanted me to push myself. And so I had a breakdown. I had like a mental breakdown because a friend of mine had died. Right. And the death of my, my cousin was, the anniversary was coming up. And it was cold and wet in Portland. And I was alone and so sad. And it's had like a meltdown. And I, heard Victor's voice, you know, in the back of my head, like make photographs of things that terrify you. And so I did, I photographed myself crying. And that was the very first time I had done that. Ah. And from there, it opened the door to more, you know, more photographs of me not happy. Right. Uh, because it's this whole thing, it's a human, it's a human response to thing. Right. To, uh, things and the fact that I was like bottling it up or I was crying, but I wasn't, you know, documenting it. It was this whole thing of, you're a black woman and like everyone expects you to be stoic and like holding it all together all the time, always. And sometimes you're just not okay. And so it became, it was the beginning of me actually letting the world know, like letting whoever was coming into contact with me know, like I'm a person first, like Mm -hmm. do not like, do not tell me how I should or shouldn't feel. Here's how we are, you know, going to go forward with all these things. Right. And so with my work now, I, I no longer stifle myself from like making those images that I know would most likely get like very negative responses if I have mm. to say anything. Like right. I, I think yeah, okay, so yeah, self portraits. I used to not photograph myself nude. I used to have like we must not do this, we must not do that because mm-hmm. I had others. I had, like the church in my ear. I had all these other things echoing and me going. I don't see the point in saying no to these things. Right, and so old way of me was how can I photograph this without it being too risque? And now I go, if you look at it with that lens, that is a you problem and not a me problem because that is not what's happening in these right. images. So if you're sexualizing this, that's you and you must unpack that. Do not put that onus on me. And so that's where the new approach versus old approach kind of go. So it's kind Thanks of Victor. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of like, you sort of kind of created or not created you've you've found like a a form of freedom uh-huh. i think i think with your work is that what i'm understanding like aside yes. from being you know kind of uh, afraid to sort of show who you are as a person now being like well i'm here you either take it or leave it i, I think that's what i'm getting at right yes that's exactly where it's at yeah, because it fucking shows, man. It's fucking amazing. <laughs> Let me tell you something, man. Fuck. I'm happy it shows because I, it's, I mean, of course I am an artist and I want sure. people to love my work and like celebrate me and everything, but I'd also be lying if I didn't say it feels kind of alienating to not have people get it. Right. Because <laughs> it feels like I'm only, um, I'm only regarded in certain spaces and it's just, to me, it's not just the music photographs and it's not just the famous person you may or may not see in my portfolio it's so much more about the heart of it which is me and the heart of my photographs you know of myself are usually the ones that get censored or the ones that are you know there's a nipple here it's right. this whole thing of the i don't know the battle of people being puritans <laughs> right, so sure. so afraid of like understanding that not everyone subscribes to whatever ideals that they have and some of us are actively just fighting against the things we were brought up with and standing firm in who we are as people Mm -hmm. and um 
yeah, it's nice to know that somebody <laughs> gets it without even having to go into the theory of it or the history of whatever history of like the black woman image. Like it's just at the very foundation core of it, the surface of it all. It's nice to know that someone can see the, I'm happy being my goddamn self. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Here we go. Right. And, and you know what? It's, it's very, it's very, you know, inspiring, uh, Courtney. And the thing that I, I, I think you need to hear is that, you know, though that, you know, you're showing your vulnerability and you're showing, uh, you know, peaks of happiness and, and, you know, sort of your lows and whatnot. Um, you know, you're doing the best you can to say to everybody, I'm just like you. I have these same emotions that you may have. I'm not perfect, you know what I mean? But the difference between you and I is that I'm not afraid to, like, you know, go through all that. And I think it's really important for artists to, you know, and, and that's probably why I, I gravitate to your work so much is because you know, there's so much symbolism and so much um, love for each image that you take or at least you, you show us, it's just like, uh-huh. I see why, like, you know, you decided to post that up. I see why, I, you know, like aesthetically, this is how I wanted the image to look like. There's a certain kind of like energy and feeling to it that I really love about your work. And goddamn, man, you did, you did such a good fucking job. All these years I followed <laughs> you, I'm like, oh man, she is kicking ass. And I, I love you for that, dude. You really inspired. Oh, dude, thank you. You know what I mean? We love you for that and, you know, all that all that shit that you've been doing. It kind of, you know, sort of teaching me to kind of understand that, you know, um, how to approach work in, in a different way and not being afraid to experiment a little. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, I really love you for that. I'm so happy that, you know, I've been able to kind of talk to you about this. As we close into this, you know, episode, there's one more question I wanted to ask you. I think you're going to have a lot of fun with it. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, you know, I, I listened to the Jeremy Bohm, uh, you know, first ever podcast that you did with him a while back. And for some reason, it, it always, like, you know, was in my head. I was listening to this. And I was like, I don't know why no one has ever asked Courtney this question. <laughs> so is there a specific song you can attach to one of your photographs? Ooh. Let me, let me, let me ask you – let me say why I asked this. Because you have such an affiliation with the punk hardcore scene. I did not know you saw Dangers – at yeah, the cobalt. At the smell. No, the right. smell. Is the smell? Is that the smell? Yeah. yeah. I I fucking love Alfred, man. He is so cool. And I got to interview him earlier this year. He's such a oh great guy. Oh my god, yes. Yes. He's him and the guitarist Justin. I sometimes casually call you know, talk to Justin because I'm a big fan of his guitar work. <laughs> um and let alone like with with the history that I have with um with uh, Jeremy. I played a show with his band in Madera, California years ago uh, when he was starting out. uh, They started out as a four piece when he was playing in Madera. And Mm -hmm. if you ever get a chance, you need to ask him a question. Hey, there was something that Arthur wanted me to ask you. What happened in Madera, California that one night? (laughs) And he'll tell you, he'll tell you that. But you affiliate yourself with so many of these musicians and such people who are very much in part of the scene. Mm-hmm. I ask these questions because I wonder: Do any of these photographs have any attachments with the songs that you've made or that you've listened to and and the images that you've made? I honestly want to say because I can't think of specific like a single image, but like I definitely do because I make books and zines and everything. Mm-hmm. I. Uh, I include a playlist with all my books and zines. And so wow. I can tell you right now that my thesis book, which I titled, um, Oh, sorry. I just, I'm currently watching, uh, Shit's Creek on, <laughs> on mute. And I forgot that the end of an episode, they give you the, the um, address to glad and all the other fun stuff I totally <laughs> forgot that, that was a thing because it's always in the back i'm not really watching it but right. i just saw like the yellow of what's happening on, on tv 
Sorry. But yeah, on my, my back to my thesis book, I titled it This Tea Shall Pass. And I remember listening to so much uh, Manchester Orchestra, which is my favorite band. Right. But I, and it was about growing up and just like all that. And so I was like trying to think of songs and artists and bands who had gotten me through this and who also are so significant to just that moment in time in Portland. And artists, like, I love the Wonder Years. Like, they are yes. a big staple for yes. that time period. So 2010 to 2013, like, those photographs were definitely made with the Wonder Years playing in the background or Manchester Orchestra playing in the background, All Get Out, mm-hmm. um, St. Hood Reps. Like, these bands are all playing. And also Touche. Touche was playing so much <laughs> during that time <laughs> to the point where I have to pick and choose when I listen to old Touche because of the fact that it was just a dark time and Courtney mm-hmm. can't go back to 2011 right, anymore. Right, right, right. But newer stuff, I am listening to a lot of Paramore, a lot of Haley Williams, mm-hmm. Taylor Swift, um, who else has listened this year a lot. A lot of Rob and a lot of Tegan and Sarah. Just <laughs> a lot of these <laughs> artists are playing in the background of the um, of the portraits I'm making. And I've also been trying to note down, like make notes of who's playing with which self portrait. So when I do revisit, I can also answer, you know, the question like yours. Right. Oh, in this image, I was listening to Tegan and Sarah and this song, or right, I was listening right. to At the Drive In or whatever. So it's just like right. things like that where can I properly go back and attribute what emotion or what feeling was with that. But definitely in the past, I, and currently in the future, I, currently in the present, my gosh. I do uh, make mixes to go along with the book or the zine because I want you to be in that same kind of headspace mm-hmm. that I was in. Even though we all can't really like mimic each other's brain waves or whatever, sure. it's just to give that that same mood of while I was making this, here are the songs that I was pulling to or who well, you know that influenced this um, this time. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's. It's a it's a blessing to know that you're still here with us, you know, really trying to do your best to not only show a bit of yourself and the community, you know, showing support of the community, you're you're always, you know, trying to help others kind of reach the goals that you're, you know, both reaching and such and I love your crew, man. You know. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, your crew is the best fucking crew, man, and it's just it's so I'm so jealous because I don't have that amount of friends to say, "Hey, man, we're photographers. We listen to music and shit." Because all they got really is just you know my girlfriend and two cats. You know what I mean? Which is not a bad thing, but you know I don't have like that kind of crew that like you have. And it's like you know what? Maybe one day I'll 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 have something like that. What Courtney's doing and and oh my god, the internet! How all of us even know each other? Like, right. I know that we're all. We're all like in our house now, but it's, it's wild because it's all literally because of the internet. And I, if you had told me this, like 10 years ago, I'd have more than like three friends who I can like actually like get together and have like a show with. I look at you like you're crazy because like my crew has always been so like a tiny little thing because I've always known a lot of people like you know right. i was like not a loner but in my head i was but i was not like a right. loner or anything it was this whole thing of i have very weird specific interests and right. i love these weird bands that no one cares about it was always a tiny small less than you know 10 people or whatever sure. so you told me this like 10 years ago i'd have multiple people who'd like want to hang out with me and also like do shows with me and right. celebrate music I think you're crazy because <laughs> what? How is that even? Where did you find these? That you know them in real life? Like how's that? Possible? Right, right. You met on the internet? Like that's a thing? Like you didn't get kidnapped? So it's this whole thing of it's definitely been like to the front exists because of the heart of every single artist involved. Yeah. And it's just an honor to be in such a space with people that I admire. Right. Like, it's just this whole thing of like you design what bands what like I love this illustration you did that holy crap it's just, yeah it's this whole thing of like one big fan 
person circle, <laughs> circle. <laughs> bunch of nerds who get to show their art and then talk about music like it's just like the nerdiest thing and then one day hopefully we can all make a living doing that like bringing art to these places and like adding more to the crew but yeah <sighs> damn <laughs> yo you know this is this is definitely enlightening for me and it, it really made me kind of happy because you know uh especially right now like the weather right now sucks. It's fucking raining here in Connecticut. That's where I live uh, right now. Yeah. East Coast East Coast uh, weather sucks. It's terrible. I've been seeing from friends like online because, you know, again, all my friends are on the East Coast. Snow and rain. Now I'm over here. Like, it's sunny over here. <laughs> <laughs> it's December. Like, it's just it's a total LA thing to have like eighty degrees on Christmas, but it's just such a thing where I'm thirty one now. I'm so tired of like the happy go lucky. It's yeah. sunny on Christmas and I'm wearing shorts and got crop top. It's right. Oh, right. no. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. It and you know what? It's funny because you fit here in the East Coast. I tell you that for sure, you know. You got the attitude. I've been trying so hard to get a residency in New York, but New York does not want me, so I have to just redirect my dreams. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> well, let me uh, tell you something, man. When you when that time comes, I'll be visiting you more often then. I'll tell you that for sure. Yes. I, I one day CPW will let me like they will invite me in. Like, yes, you can come to Woodstock. I will do that. It will <laughs> be a great summer. Come to Woodstock. But until then, I would just love it from afar and be like, you know what? Fine. I don't want to be in New York, even though I do want to be in New York for a hot second. Hey, and and I, I'll be waiting. And you know what? I just wanted to ask, did you have fun with this interview? I did. This is so fun. <laughs> it's like, no, like every interview, I'm always nervous because I have the tendency of running my mouth. Right. And so I'm just honored that anyone wants to speak to me about my work. Mm. Because I grew up looking at artists' websites and their CVs and their resumes and going, wow, they're so accomplished. Like, they've done X, Y, Z. And to look at my own CV and my own website and look at that from, like, another person's perspective going, wow, you are so cool on paper. Like, I would love to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> if I didn't know you, I'd want to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. Because I... I definitely am very, very aware of how I may come off if you don't already know me. And if you've never spoken with me, I may seem like standoffish or intimidating or whatever. Mm. And I know that people are so missing the like opportunities, like joke around with me because I'm at the core. Like I'm such a goober. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm smart. I'm, I, you know, I know what I'm talking about. I'm intelligent. I'm passionate. I love these things, but I'm also such a jokester where it's like, Oh, okay. You're so, okay. You do not intimidate me at all. You're so harmless. Like, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you for getting it. Let's talk about let's talk about cameras. Let's talk about whatever. Let's talk about music because yeah. the internet makes. I mean, I'm the same way online as I am in person. It's just you can't tell that I'm laughing most of the time online because <laughs> there's no voice. I mean, there is voice. I'm not putting my my voice on Twitter, but like you can do that. But I feel like most people are they don't get to see that side of me. So I love these interviews where I'm able to actually speak. Yes. I'm definitely, and I'm definitely happy that, you know, you, uh, give me the opportunity to kind of sit with you today on a Saturday and kind of talk about these kinds of things that we're so passionate about. Courtney, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to leave it off here with you to say that you are definitely, one of my biggest inspirations that oh. <laughs> and and i'm gonna just just to kind of like you know let you know that you know because of your your accomplishments you know just doing it all by yourself having also your friends supporting you along the way making this crew of like women kind of create bodies of work industry is taking interest in seeing what you guys do in and You've really, you and your crew have really shown like that you don't need industry to make moves. You guys are making nope. moves and you're really doing it. Courtney Coles, I love you. I am so happy I got to talk to you. I hope we can do this once again soon. You cool with that? I'm so down. All right. All right. Courtney Coles, thank you very much. I'm going to head out. Thank you very much for talking to me, Courtney. I'll see you later. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye, dude. Bye. 
And that'll do it for this episode of the Bueno Power Hour podcast. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much to Courtney for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to her and, um, you know, just really nerd out on a couple of things. Uh, I know that I stumbled a little bit on it because I was a little nervous talking to her, man. You know, I still am. And she's just a really cool person. Uh, I love her work. I love what she's doing for the community. And I hope she continues to succeed. And and yeah. So guys, if you like this episode, go ahead and hit that like button. And if you want more episodes like this in the future, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And as always, thank you for tuning in to the Bueno Power Hour podcast. See you later. Be safe.